said what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear and what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit and what needless pains we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer can we go and carry our troubles, our burdens to the Lord in prayer? As we, Will you join me as we approach the throne of mercy? Gracious God, our Father, we, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies and for the blessings of life and the blessings of this day. Oh God, we are thankful that we're able to gather in this virtual space, touching and agreeing to worship and praise your glorious, holy and righteous name. Oh God, we love you, we adore you, we appreciate you, we applaud you. We give you the fruit of our lips. You are God and God all by yourself. And, and so we thank you. We worship you. We, we call upon you in obedience. You told us to cast our cares upon you knowing that you care for us. So we thank, thank you for the privilege to approach your th throne of mercy and cast our cares upon you. And we thank you for caring for us, for loving us. How do we know? Because you gave us your only begotten son that whosoever would believe will not perish but have everlasting life. We know because while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So our strong God, we ask that you would touch our hearts and our minds and that our love for you will grow more with each and every day that we will thirst for you like the deer thirst for the water, for the brook. Oh God, we pray that you would touch our leaders, national, state, local, that, that you will be respected in Congress, that you will be respected in the White House, that you will be respected in the State House, in the Governor's Mansion, on the City Council, in the School House, on the School Board. We pray, oh God, that 
a love, reverence, and respect for you will return to the land. Help us here at the mount to reverence, to respect you, to love you and obey. Our strong God, we ask you to forgive us of our sins and our sinfulness and create within each and every one of us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. We pray that you would bless us individually and collectively with the blessings that we stand in the need of. Oh God, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you. Pray that your will will be done in the earth, in our lives, as it is in heaven. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Mount Moriah. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. How many that the Lord is mighty? He's bigger than any of your problems that you may face any, in, in any place of your life. Amen. Yeah. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Say, Lord, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord to mighty, Lord to mighty, Lord to mighty, Lord to mighty. Oh Lord, how excellent is the name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens and the earth. When I Lord, you're mighty. 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 Lord, you're mighty.
serve a mighty God that deserves a mighty praise. Hallelujah. 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 It's the highest praise. And that's what he is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on right there in this atmosphere. We can begin to worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, your excess love that you give unto us, sometimes we don't even deserve it, but yet it's still you still give it to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Excess love. <laughs> His love is, is, is in excess. He, he always gives us more than we deserve. He, His love always makes you feel like He's going above and beyond. Is that your testimony? Can, can you talk about the excess love? Well, let me ask you this Has He been better to you? that you deserve, that's excess love. Did he forgive you? Yet again, for something you said, you now you never do again, that's excess love. Did he make a way out of no way when you put yourself in a trick bag? That's excess love. I'm so glad that his love is never ending. I'm so glad that his love is long suffering. Oh, come on and put those blessed hands together and give God praise for his excess love. Give God praise for loving you, loving me, in spite of ourselves. Excess love is why we have new mercies every morning. Excess love is why we hadn't been cut off when we deserve to be hallelujah Lord thank you thank you for loving us even when we don't know how to love ourselves and don't know how to love you thank you for your excess love let's give God praise for the praise team the musicians the band hallelujah Hallelujah. 
If you have your, your Bibles, your copy of the Word of God, would you go with us to the book of Acts, chapter 16? And for the benefit of brevity and the sake of our subject, I want us to look at verse 25 from Acts, chapter 16. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. And if you're physically able, wherever you are, would you stand in honor of the Word of God? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do no harm to yourself, for we are all here. And my brothers and sisters... For the next few moments that I was to share, I simply want to talk to you from this thought, this theme. Praise under pressure. Let the church say praise under pressure. Gracious God, I come before you humbly as I know how. I'm mindful, cognizant of the fact that without you we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. So I pray like the psalmist that you would allow us to behold great wonders out of your law. I pray like the Apostle Paul that you would allow me to preach, not with enticing words of my own wisdom, but in a true demonstration of your Holy Spirit and power. That I might make known the mysteries of your gospel. To the end that you, you alone are glorified and magnified. The saints are edified and multiplied. Satan is horrified and petrified and sinners will become justified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, it's midnight in the text. Midnight, colloquially, metaphorically, is known as the darkest hour. Paul and Silas are in jail having been beaten and locked up. But the text says that they prayed. And sang praises unto God. And my brothers and sisters, sooner or later, it'll happen to all of us. All of us will have a midnight experience. And as a matter of fact, I believe that the vast majority of you listening to me now can testify that you've had more than one midnight experience. America, as a nation, we've had several midnight experiences, the most recent one being COVID-19. Prior to that, uh, we could look back at September the 11th. And prior to that, we could look back at the civil rights movement. And prior to that, we could look back at uh, Jim Crow and Reconstruction. And prior to that, we could look at the midnight of slavery here in America. Well, my brothers and sisters, all of us will, if we have not, experience midnight in our lives. And when we experience midnight, my brothers and sisters, we are under pressure. And I submit to you this morning that if we are going to be the kind of Christians that God would have us to be, we need to learn how to praise God even under pressure. My daddy would say it this way, pressure can bust a pipe or make a diamond. And so my brothers and sisters, praise is extremely important to God. Man was created to fellowship with God and a big part of our fellowship is our praise to God. And our praise ought not to be limited to certain times you know some folk can only praise God in the church house and to those people my question to you what have you been doing since the church doors have closed and we've been in the virtual space I hope that you have not um, 
I hope that you have not gone without praising God this past year simply because you worked in church, in the church building. And my brothers and sisters, praise should be habitual. In other words, uh, we ought to praise God when we get up in the morning for waking us up and starting us on our way. We ought to praise him in the evening uh, after he's allowed us to make it safely home and our, our family as well. We, we, we ought to give God praise every day because he is good and worthy every day. Since we wake up to new mercies every morning, we ought to wake up with new praise on our lips. When we praise God, we are about important business. When the Bible mentions something over and over again, it means that it's important and worth noting. Praising God is mentioned over a hundred times in the Psalms alone, not to mention the other 65 books. Praise is important business to God. The psalmist said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And I've said it before and I've said it again. It doesn't matter whether you've got good breath or bad breath. If you got breath, you ought to be praising the Lord. And it's not difficult to praise God when things are going well for you. No, it's not hard to praise God when ways are being made out of no way. It doesn't take any spiritual maturity to praise God when your loved one is healed from their sick bed. It doesn't take spiritual maturity to praise God when that child was falsely accused, is acquitted and set free. Some things just come naturally. The test comes when circumstances are unpleasant and we find ourselves under pressure. So many of us are on various medications for hypertension brought on by the pressures of life. When your cost of living has risen here, but your pay is still down here, that's pressure. When bill collectors are calling, and you're afraid to answer the phone, that's pressure. When death, when a pandemic, pandemic hits and causing death and destruction, that's pressure. When lives are lost and families are torn asunder, that's pressure. When all lives don't matter because black lives don't matter, that's pressure. When dreams are dashed and hopes are vanquished, that's pressure. When it's open season on black lives by the cops and racist Karens and Kins, that's pressure. When love dies and divorce follows, that's pressure. When, when trouble, sickness, and death come knocking, that's pressure. When your child turns to drugs and ends up in jail or uh, uh, living the gang life, that's pressure. When children are having children, when they are children themselves and the grandparents are left raising the child and the grandchild. And that's pressure. When all hell breaks loose in your life, leaving you in a pressure cooker, that's pressure. My brothers and sisters, the text lets us know that the children of God will experience pressure. And Jesus, as a matter of fact, said in this world you will have trouble. Trouble causes pressure. But he said, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't fall out. Don't have a pity party. Don't get depressed because why? He said, I've overcome the world. My brothers and sisters, I don't know about you this morning, but it seems the more I try to live for God, the greater the pressure. Mount Moriah knows what I'm talking about. You don't last. 108 years doing the work of the church without experiencing some pressure. Paul and Silas are in Macedonia, uh, in the chief city of the region of Macedonia known as Philippi. And they have been proclaiming the gospel and they were eager and excited to do it in Philippi. And when they got to the region, they, the text says that they were looking for the place of prayer. And as they were on their way to the place of prayer, a girl with a spirit of divination followed them. My brothers and sisters, the spirit of divination refers to the use of magic. Uh, you might refer to it as voodoo or hoodoo. 
She was a fortune teller. She was the Madam Cleo of her day. She didn't have a standalone store with a palm uh, in the window saying uh, palm reader, fortune teller. I believe she had more of a, a pop-up shop because the text said that she followed Paul and Silas. And our brothers and sisters, I think I ought to tell you that she chose some good people to follow. Everybody is not worthy to be followed. And we need to make sure we choose good people to follow. My grandfather said, Eric, it ain't nothing wrong with being a copycat, son. Just make sure that you copy the right cat. And we need to make sure that we are copying and following the right people. Young people especially need to hear me when I say make sure you choose good people to follow. Make sure you choose good cats to copy. Following the wrong cat can leave you dead or in jail, broke or homeless, illiterate, and economically, socially, and spiritually bankrupt. Choosing the wrong people to follow can cause you unnecessary pain and heartache, but choosing good people, the right people to follow, will lead you down a road of hope and opportunity. If you don't believe me, just ask the followers of Donald Trump. They've chosen to follow the wrong person, and now... Some of them are facing federal charges for an insurrection. Some of his closest pawns have either gone to jail for following him or are about to go to jail for following him. Somebody, my brothers and sisters, knows what I'm talking about. You followed some wrong people in your day, and as a result, you've experienced the problems and pain that come from following the wrong people. But this girl in our text, she followed Paul and Silas followed some good people. And when she followed them, she was crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God, which proclaim to you the way of salvation. And the text says that she did this many days. She did it until Paul got fed up. She did it until Paul got mad. Now the question that begs to be answered is, why did Paul get angry? The text says that after she had done this for several days that uh, Paul was annoyed, he was angry, and he rebuked the spirit. Now, my brothers and sisters, I have to be honest, when I was wrestling and reading the text, I felt some kind of way about Paul. I felt some kind of way that it took Paul a few days of her continuously saying to him, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you a way of salvation. My brothers and sisters, because she was a slave girl. The text tells us that she was a slave girl and that her, her masters, her, her owners were exploiting this enslaved girl. And my brothers and sisters, I feel like that Paul should have gotten angry day one when he saw her situation. But my brothers and sisters, Paul is like a whole lot of us. We don't want to get involved at first. We, we don't want to be bothered unless it starts to impact us. And because she was following them day after day, uh, uh, saying this and drawing uh, negative attention, my brothers and sisters, Paul, he got mad and he said something to the spirit, not the girl. And I want to put a quote in the meeting and just simply say, don't wait until uh, something impacts you negatively before you speak up and speak out. As uh, soon as you see wrong, soon as you see uh, something that shouldn't be, you ought to say something, especially if you are a child of God. But I don't want to beat Paul up because Paul, he did finally say something. So better late than never. But Paul got fed up. And when Paul got mad, he spoke. He spoke and commanded the spirit to come out of the girl and notice too that Paul didn't speak to the girl Paul didn't condemn the girl for her condition 
And so when we see folk who are in uh, uh, negative conditions because they've been enslaved and exploited by the system that we're in, don't speak. Or don't condemn the person for the situation that they find themselves in. Don't condemn them for their condition. But speak to the system, to the, to the spirit that's responsible for enslaving and exploiting the girl. And my brothers and sisters, Paul spoke to the spirit to come out, delivering the girl from her bondage and giving her hope. And we can learn a lesson from Paul here when we see the devil at work we ought to get angry we ought to get angry enough to tear his kingdom down we ought to get angry enough to do something if we got angry then there would not be so many abused and neglected children if we got angry we wouldn't tolerate greedy self-serving politicians if we got angry, we, we would get more involved in the social and political aspects of our communities. If we got angry, we would get out and vote no matter what the weather. If we did not have a ride, we'd find one or walk. We wouldn't let them suppress our vote. If we got angry, we would not tolerate our children acting in self-destructive ways and to ease our conscience, tell ourselves that that's how kids act. Kids just going to be this the kids of this day. They'll grow out of it. The Bible said that we ought to train up a child in the way that it should go, that when it's old, it will not depart. They may deviate, but they won't depart. If we got angry, we would continue to fight for equal opportunity for all people. If we got angry, we would do something about the drug problem of our communities. If we got angry, we would demand that the same government that, is, that, that has spent billions of dollars on destruction and annihilation of people under the guise of liberation in countries across the world would we'll spend that same, those same billions of dollars educating and training our children so that our children can be liberated from the ignorance, disenfranchisement, economic, social, and political oppression. God does not tell us, God doesn't tell us not to get angry. Getting angry is okay but he does say don't sin when you get angry he says get angry but don't sin and my brothers and sisters when we see things that are wrong and we get angry but don't do nothing I submit to you that we got angry and we sinned even though uh, uh, getting angry and sinning could refer to me being angry at something you did to me so in response to what you did then I sin well if if I get if I see something that's wrong, that makes me angry, and I do nothing, I believe that I've sinned. When we see the devil at work and sit idly by and do nothing, we're sinning. We need to get angry and do something. Harriet Tubman got angry and did something. That's why we had the Underground Railroad. Frederick Douglass got angry and became an abolitionist. W.E.B. Du Bois got angry and started the NAACP. Rosa Parks got angry and refused to give up her seat. MLK Jr. got angry and led the Civil Rights Movement, ultimately dying because he couldn't sit idly by while the devil did his thing. And so, my brothers and sisters, Paul got angry and delivered the girl from the spirit of divination and the story is that there were some men who owned the girl and profited from her work from her bondage they exploited her and they were upset when Paul delivered her from the spirit of divination I've said it before and I'll say it again everybody ain't happy when we get delivered Oh, my brothers and sisters, the, the men, they weren't happy when she got delivered. And as a result, my brothers and sisters, they got angry and they called, grabbed Paul and Silas and took them, had them arrested and lied on them. Paul and Silas had not done anything wrong and they still wound up in jail. This lets me know that we can be doing just what God would have us to do and still find ourselves 
in a pressure cooker. So here Paul and Silas have been arrested, brought up on trumped up charges. They lying on them. My brothers and sisters, think about what's going on today when you have people who are politicizing a pandemic, who are politicizing a vaccine. Them, they themselves have taken the vaccine, but they are operating in propaganda to try to get people not to take the vaccine so that they can uh, try to say uh, you made a promise that so many people were going to be vaccinated by a certain time but that didn't happen ha uh ha -huh. well brothers and sisters they're operating in a lie and the people who are following them they've chosen the wrong people to follow them the bible says that the truth the truth brings healing. The truth brings, and so if the truth brings healing, then what do lies bring? And so my brothers and sisters, Paul and Silas hadn't done anything wrong, but they still ended up in jail. They're under pressure. And their jail ain't like our jail. Jail ain't good, I don't care how you look at it. I don't wanna go to jail. But my brothers and sisters, Paul and Silas' jails were inhumane. And they didn't have running water. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have central heat and air. Uh, they, they, they were in a dungeon, dark, damp, dank, stank dungeon. This folks, somebody died in the jail. They didn't remove them right away. You might be chained up to a dead person and have to uh, drag that dead person around when you went to the bathroom. And my brothers and sisters, the conditions of their jail was horrific. And it's this environment, my brothers and sisters, under these deplorable conditions, roaches and rats everywhere, the smell of urine and feces, skeletal remains of past prisoners, they were under pressure. They had been beaten bloody and blue and their bodies ached from pain. They were under pressure. But even with all this, Paul and Silas didn't give up. In fact, the scripture says that they prayed and sang praises unto God. And my brothers and sisters, can I tell you that prayer is always appropriate. And can I tell you what prayer is? The Bible said that man ought to always pray. My brothers and sisters, Jesus said, when you pray, letting us know that the expectation of the master is that we pray. But can I tell you what prayer is? Prayer is your hotline to heaven. Prayer is your modem to the master. Prayer is your hookup to the Holy Ghost. Prayer is your facts to the Father. Your DSL to deliverance. Prayer is your high speed connection to God. And you show sure enough need to be connected to God to praise God under pressure the record is that they sang praises unto God I don't know what song they sang they could have sung when I consider the heavens the work of thy fingers the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him they could have sang oh lord how excellent is thy name in all the earth they could have sung psalm 18 i will love thee oh lord my strength the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God and my strength in whom 
I will always trust my buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Maybe they sang Psalm 34. I bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I can see Paul turning to Silas and saying, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I don't know what they sang, but the record is that they sang praises under pressure. And I think I ought to tell you that when you praise God under pressure, you get positive results because God inhabits the praises of his people. They praise God under pressure. And my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that when they praise God in the midnight hour, at the darkest hour, they were still praising and giving thanks to God. The Bible says that God sent a mighty earthquake that shook the foundations of the jail, causing a show enough jailhouse rock. And the record is that the shackles fell off of all the prisoners and the door swung open, letting us know that when we praise God under pressure, he'll open some doors that no man can close. The shackles that had you bound, he'll make those fall off too. When we praise God under pressure, he'll set you free from whatever had you bound. And I don't know about you this morning, but there are some doors that I need open. And I've learned that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So if he was causing doors to open then, he can call them to open now. Paul and Silas ain't the first to praise God under pressure. Noah praised God under pressure, trying to live a godly life in a sin-sick world. He was building an ark on dry ground. It had never rained before. And folk, I'm sure you know how folk are, they were probably talking smack. And with every strike of his hammer, I can hear Noah saying, thank you, Lord. Glory to your name. Then there was David, a man after God's own heart, a man who was constantly having to fight for his life, a man whose whole life was lived under pressure. Yet he's the one who said that he would bless the Lord at all times and his praise will continually be in his mouth. That means that no matter what we are going through, no matter what our circumstance, we ought to be able to bless the Lord at all times. His praise ought to continually be in my mouth. That's what I came to tell you, Mount Moriah. That's what I want to leave you with. Keep praising God, even under pressure. Don't want to know where your next meal is coming from. Give God praise, because I heard the psalmist say, I've been young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, or a seed begging for bread. Keep praising him in the midnight hour. Praise him through the storm and the rain. Praise him when your way gets dark and you can't see his lovely face. Watch God step in and deliver you. Watch him step in and make a way out of no way. Several years ago, when my grandfather was living, he was battling cancer. He was in the hospital. Didn't know where he was, what year it was. He was under all kind of medications. And my brothers and sisters, when we would go see him, he wouldn't be conscious. And so we would be in the room and we would be talking amongst ourselves. And one day, I was sitting there 
talking with my grandmama all of a sudden we heard my granddaddy talking we thought he was talking to us we turned and looked at him but he had his hands up and his mouth was moving and he said lord i love you lord i bless your name he just kept saying hallelujah lord i love you on his sick bed monitors hooked all up to him he may not have known who we were but he never forgot who god was and even though he was fighting for his life he still took time to praise god under pressure and i said that day if my granddaddy can praise god while he's on his deathbed as long as i got breath in my body i'm gonna give god praise can you give him praise say yeah say yeah if god's been good to you give god praise right where you are don't wait for the battle to be over give god praise now because your victory is assured you will you will make it through praise god under pressure pressure ain't gonna stop and so like my dad says it can bust a pipe but pressure is also used to make a diamond be that diamond when you praise God under pressure you won't burst no but you'll come through just like Paul and Silas delivered and shining <laughs> like a diamond give God praise and continue to praise him even in your circumstance remembering that right now ain't forever and so if you're going through the storm and the rain right now give him praise because storms don't last always God bless you I love you the word of God has gone forth mightily God's word declares that his word shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he purposed. And we know that if you don't have a relationship with God the Father, through God the Son, that the purpose of that word was to invite you to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as ABC. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Acknowledge that Christ is the Son of the living God. Believe that he died on your behalf and that God raised him from the dead. And confess that belief with your mouth. And the Bible declares that you will be saved, that you are saved. And if you made that declaration and that decree, would you come in the chat and let us know would you email us or call us so that we can celebrate with you in your decision to take God at his word? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you for the blessings of life and the blessings of this day. We thank you for this worship experience. We thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the privilege to worship you through giving. We ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver, that both will be used for the furtherance and upbuilding of your kingdom. And we pray that no one who gave will suffer because of that gift but we'll all find your word to be true when you promise to meet and supply every need according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus when you said that if we bring the tithes into the storehouse that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we would not have room enough to receive 
when you said if we give it shall be given unto us good measure pressed down shaken together running over shall men give into our bosom and our strong God we we thank you for again how you moved mightily on our hearts we ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us pray oh God that you would continue to bless us and keep us make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us pray that you would lift up your countenance upon us and grant us your peace a peace that the world did not give and therefore the world cannot take away a peace that surpasses all understanding and a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus now may trouble neglect us may our neighbors respect us may angels protect us and when you call may heaven accept us this is our prayer in Jesus name God bless you have a wonderful week until we meet again